go. We're going. Good afternoon, Frank. Good afternoon, Professor uh, Order. Uh, it seems as though um, for, for some time now, every time we meet, the situation in Egypt gets more and more unpredictable and uh, I suppose one could say um, worrying. I'm not sure what would be the best adjective. Uh, and it's difficult to talk about it objectively without getting involved in the case one side or the other. And of course, different people have different um, hopes about the way things will end up, even though I think most people uh, wish that the killing would stop. And it's not easy to understand why there's been so much killing. However, I think from our point of view, it's something that we need to study from the point of view of um, people interested in globalization and what it may mean for globalization. And I think it's very interesting that uh, it, it, almost every sentence that's uh, um, enunciated that has to do with something that's going on there uses the word democracy mm -hmm. as though that's the key to everything. And I think that uh, part of the problem is the expectations of democracy and the fact that um, the framework we had for fulfilling our expectations of democracy over the last couple of generations isn't working anymore. And uh, the real problem in Egypt is that um, the uh, population is divided between two different sets of people with a lot of divisions within each of them that have totally different objectives. And the democratic, the democratic process didn't satisfy either of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Morsi, the, the people who support Morsi say he had to be president, he has to stay president because he was elected democratically. Well, maybe he was, but uh, um, it was, he didn't have a large majority. There are questions about how representative the election, I'm not saying that it was fraudulent, but uh, questions about how representative the final result was of all the opinion in the country. And um, then he obviously was carrying out his responsibilities in a way which was not trying to satisfy everybody in the country. Right, right. And it was for that reason that some people decided that, uh, that that version of democracy wasn't working and they better try another version. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult in the, in the modern world to see what else you can do. Um, and of course what uh, the um, uh, moderate critics have been were hoping, like al Baradi, was that uh, you just contain the demonstrations until they faded away. And the army wasn't uh, willing to do that, which is unfortunate. Well, However, well, go ahead, go ahead. Um, the, um, the, the, the problem, well, you probably heard that many people have said that you can't have democracy in a country just by telling them to do things according to the democratic, the, the, the recipe for democracy, because it won't work unless they start off by developing the institutions on which democracy as we know it in the West is based. And so people who have read that and are aware of it aren't going to be surprised that democracy isn't working in Egypt because they don't have the institutions. Um, and then, of course, that, that's going to lead to the conclusion that democracy isn't going to work anywhere in the Middle East because nowhere in the Middle East do they have these institutions and if we wait for the institutions to develop even if they do start to develop it's going to take at least a generation so this is very a very pessimistic way of looking at things but um, I wonder whether um, the problem isn't even much larger than that in that the democracies that we thought were fantastic in the last century are ceasing to work now as well as they worked in the last century um, I'm not sure whether I should start with, with America or some other example to begin with. Uh, but the, the larger each um, 
electorate becomes, the more and more difficult it is for the whole electorate to choose one government and for that mm -hmm. government to satisfy the whole electorate. Mm -hmm. And that's, well, that's the coming problem, I think. Well, I, th I think your analysis of Egypt is, uh, is, is quite accurate. Um, what, what's been going on there, what happened with, with Morsi's election, narrow as it was, and then subsequently the military's uh, overthrow of him, uh, presumably equally as narrow because there were a whole bunch of people who still support the Muslim Brotherhood. It was a winner-take-all kind of thing. It was, all right, if 50.01% of the people are in favor of it, then the other 49.9% are, are really out in the cold. It's, it's like a, a schoolyard grudge match, and that's it. There are no internal checks and balances. There are no institutions. In the United States, if the uh, losing party loses the election, they're consoled by the fact that there are, is a bicameral legislature and there's an independent judiciary. So somehow there's a feeling that they're going to be um, protected against the, the most wild notions of the winner. But that doesn't exist here. Um, as soon as Morsi was elected, uh, he began to move against the Supreme Court. Uh, he began to move against uh, anybody who was in the way of the Muslim Brotherhood. And it was as if the, uh, the people who voted against them simply didn't matter. Now, whether or not that's an outgrowth of the tribal mentality and, and, and view that many Middle Easterners presumably have from, from what we read, I don't know. And then when the military took over, their view was exactly the same way, but it was the other side of the pendulum. So I, I think your point about how long it will take to develop institutions is a good one. In the United States, John Marshall uh, came out with his, his biggest opinions in 1810, 1812, uh, perhaps 20 or so years after the uh, judiciary was, was formed. So maybe it would take a generation, I, I would think. But insofar as making a comparison to, to the Western democracies, I'm mean, sure they're not working as well as they used to be, maybe. But they're, they're certainly, I don't think, uh, I, I think that the checks and balances that are in place still allow for some reasonable uh, recourse to people if they if they lose elections well you know the problem with checks and balances is that they produce very good log jams they do uh, uh, and um, the um, the checks and balances and the system that we developed in the 19th century worked very well in the 20th century uh, which was the century of um, modernism uh, in which everybody was beginning to get used to uh, the idea of the era of technology, the new atmosphere, the new environment. But basically people knew their place in society and um, not everybody was active in the formation of the public opinion that uh, finishes up determining who wins an election. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the last uh, couple of decades really since the World Wide Web began, and the World Wide Web obviously has something to do with this, and that sort of technology, and uh, Facebook and Twitter and everything else, um, everybody is participating in the formation of public opinion. And that is what is weakening the institutions on which democracy was based, because Formerly, when you had the institutions out of which you could grow this uh, democratic structure of, of one government replacing the next, the, the, the last, um, people were participating through the institutions, right, which structured right. the participation. And now, they're not. I, uh, I agree with you. The, the institutions in Washington right now are increasingly irrelevant, mm. absolutely irrelevant. And uh, they're, they're, they're moribund. Nothing happens there. I mean, bills can't be passed. Uh, what they discuss uh, is, a particular, is a particular interest to small minorities. But the, the rest of the country seems to be speeding along on some sort of a highway of, of interests and concerns. While meanwhile, what's happening in Washington is, is in a, it's on a different planet entirely, framework-wise. So whether or not I mean, what this means, I'm not sure, because it's still a, it's still a nation of laws. The laws are, are made by governments, and they're enforced by governments. So how far this, this imbalance can go until the pinball machine tilts? The, the laws guess. are made by governments, but they're interpreted by lawyers. <laughs> well, they're interpreted by lawyers. I mean, that, that's, that's true, but, but they're also... 
I mean, they're, they're in, in this instance, let's put it like this, right? What, what we have is the very real possibility, and, and not, not to cast a judgment on one side or another, but we have a Supreme Court that, assuming there are no vacancies in the next three and a half years, is, by anybody's definition, quite to the right of the view of most people in the country. So, all right, that's one of the big checks and balances. Now, from my perspective, that's not necessarily all bad because it proves the system works in action, so to speak. From, it gives a time the dimension to the system. The as a check on the other branch. But the day that, that the Supreme Court begins to issue opinions and decides laws are proper or improper, and something happens and people or states choose not to enforce those opinions, that's when anarchy is going to begin. As long as the enforcement mechanism from the Supreme Court on down still works, and as long as the enforcement mechanism from the executive still works, if the FBI will act or the National Guard can be mobilized, things are still orderly. But my, I, I see what's happening with the speed of the internet and the speed of the globalization on a horizontal level, that there will come a day when all of a sudden it's, it's going to be like those soldiers in Tehran in 1978 with their M-16s and young girls walking up putting roses in the gun barrels. I mean, this will happen here. People are going to overcome the inertia and those who are charged with enforcing the government's edicts, I don't think are going to be able to do it. Uh, I remember back in those days, um, uh, people making, uh, um, Westerners making fun of the way things worked in Iran. Everything was done in, in, in circles that met in private houses. The evenings, which is a traditional Persian institution, mm -hmm. which has a name and works according to certain rules, and, and nothing really got done in the uh, democratic institutions of the majlis and the and the political parties and things like that 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 had been developed according to Western models, and what I told them was that in my experience in Washington, it's exactly the same. If you really want to understand what's going on in politics, you need to know who goes to whose parties in the evenings. That's that's true, that's true. Um, but it was so, it was it was in those parties in Tehran that apparently the the sense of uh, safety was conveyed that, yes, you could go out to the soldiers and put mm -hmm. a flower mm -hmm. in the gun, and you weren't going to get shot, and mm -hmm. the soldiers would stand down. So if that happens here or in the Western democracies, then all of a sudden that enforcement mechanism goes, and then the institution crumbles. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what is going to take everybody by surprise is that the... Um, functioning of, of the democracies in which we have so much pride is gradually going to get uh, less and less efficient. And at the same time, the way the society works here and the way the society, that society works in many Middle Eastern countries and certainly Iran uh, is going to become more and more similar. More, more, they'll be more and more like each other. That is, that everybody will be participating in the formation of public opinion, and everything will be worked out in in terms of um, negotiation in public media, mm -hmm. uh, and the government will have to somehow try to keep up with it. And gradually, perhaps, the governments will be restructured. But um, it, it's certainly vo uh, having um, over. 50 million voters voting for one leader who will then work in, in the interests of all of them and satisfy them for a, a, a statutory period, I don't think is going to work anymore. You've had this view for a while, and mm -hmm. we've been talking for a couple of years. <laughs> and when, when you first espoused this view, I thought you were pretty far out there. <laughs> but I have to tell you that I agree with you now. Uh, right, because I, the velocity, the velocity of, of change that's going on on the ground amongst the people, uh, when, when compared to the, the, the stagnation in Washington, it's, it's just the contrast is so stark uh, that as obtuse as I am, I can even pick up the difference. Uh, and uh, it's, it's chilling. It does not bode well for the future. If I lived inside the Beltway, 
my days would be numbered, I would be afraid. I mean, the things are going to change dramatically. They have to because there will come a day when all of a sudden people are going to say, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to pay attention to that rule or law or bill or admonition, whatever. That's the, that's, that's the problem, because in, in, in England, where things work very differently, and I used to think in a much more practical way, in which the members of parliament have to um, satisfy uh, their voters, otherwise they don't get re-elected, and if the prime minister doesn't satisfy the MPs, he gets voted out, however long he's been in there, right. and somebody else has to get voted in. Uh, and that seemed very good, and that has worked for a century or so. I so it's worked for longer than that in England. But I think even that is going to cease to work, because it won't be possible for anybody to satisfy enough people for long enough to make the government uh, an efficient organ, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. unless it is somehow devolved into something that's uh, smaller. Uh, with a, a, a smaller number of people that have to be satisfied in any particular function. Is there is there any model out there, governmental, institution, corporate, uh, uh, tribal, familial, uh, that, that strikes you as perhaps workable? Not yet. Really? Not, not that I am aware of, no. Now that's, that's, uh, more, that's more depressing than everything else we've talked because, about. Because, you see, the problem is that we have... Uh, a society has been getting more and more complex, and as it got more and more complex, we've developed more and more uh, sophisticated rules and codes and uh, um, ways of getting things done that all depended on people being willing to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now is that because of the rate of change, nobody's doing anything the right way. Mm -hmm. And so we have no models for running a situation with nobody doing things the right way. Now, that's great fodder for pessimists, but I'm an optimist. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very interested in watching what happens, assuming that we will work something out, because after all, human beings have been innovating for 250,000 years and doing it very successfully, faster and faster all the time. So I'm sure they'll manage to do this as well. Well, that, that, that's a good point. In fact, you're... you're <laughs> You're, it's probably a good point to, to end on, but uh, well, well, no, we do... should end on the fact that we should make sure everybody knows that this is the first day of the 2013 Festival of Uncivilization in Hampshire, England. The uh, Festival uh, of Uncivilization. Is together to un look for answers to questions about our collective future in a rapidly changing and depleting world. Wow. But maybe we'll talk about that next week. Well, I'm sure by then there'll be press reports on it. I'll look forward to reading that. All right. Th thank you, Professor. Okay. Sure.